Have you been to the new brewery? You know, it was beautiful. It was great. I got a great beer. And uh, I was one of the guys who you know, works with. I was talking to him, and I said, I think that for seven years, since he's lived there, they've been walking to keep up his house. World Coffee has bought in, Billy Burgers, and now a brewery. So that's like the neighboring thing. I mean, I'm imagining like a, a brewery with a walking distance from my house. Like, And how are you? Hello. Nice to see you. And I'm going to set a time limit at 9 o'clock. Here's my hour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Give me some tight seating here. Two, two minutes. Eight, 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 eight. I'm going to. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we didn't do it. I think we're fine just as we are. Hi. Yeah. Good. Good. How are you? 
No, this is Jacques. This is Jacques. Jacques here. Jacques. Where is he? I don't know. He was here. Yeah. He's got it. I hope. I thought I texted when we got done. I'm sure you'll. Okay. So you did walk. I, I, yeah, I went and met with Mike on the way here. Forgot. He's doing fine. Yeah. So, yeah, he has first, doing. He has first operation today. Yeah. Forgot. I guess I don't really need this here. Uh, my pen. It's kind of tight with ten people. Oh, I did have my notes on what I. Had. This is like the uh, general plan committee. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> what a nice thing to say. Yes. Well, I can. Well, my chair's finished. There's aspects of it here. No, I got this one. <laughs> Spontaneous. Welcome to the April 30th meeting of the joint meeting of the Capitol Planning Commission and City Council. Uh, roll call, please. City Council, then Planning Commission, please. Planning Commissioner Welsh? Here. Councilmember Botter? Here. Planning Commissioner Ortiz? Here. Um, Councilmember Bertrand? Here. Planning Commissioner Newman? Here. Planning Commissioner Westman? Here. Planning Commission Chairperson Smith? Here. Mayor Norton? And Councilmember Harlan. We all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Led by Katie. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. No, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Which one you want? Yeah. I'm the one that has it. Okay. We, we have an extensive agenda tonight and dealing with a number of zoning ordinance issues that these meetings will go on for approximately five to six meetings and that um, we will allow for communi oral communications from anyone from the public on any issue that is not on this agenda. Um, if you'd like to step forward, we're going to allow two minutes tonight uh, for anyone to discuss any issue they have. Please step forward. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members, um, planning commission members and staff. My name is Richard Livy, Lippy. I live on uh, Monterey Avenue adjacent to the uh, Monterey Park. Um, I submitted a letter uh, to um, uh, Sue uh, Snedden uh, about um, my subject here tonight. So you have it for reference, one's to the City Council and one's to the Planning Commission. And I would just like to say that I am a resident, taxpayer, registered voter, and volunteer in the City of Capitola. I have been in my current residence for four and a half years on Monterey Avenue adjacent to Monterey Park. In that time, the prospect of a skate park within Monterey Park has been discussed but never debated. There are many issues that I believe should be brought out in the open for all concerned citizens to consider when discussing the latest proposal of a 6,000 square foot skate park at Monterey Park. I would even like to see a public debate on the issue. With respect to the proposed 6,000 square foot skate park at Monterey Park, the following observations are my own and listed in no particular order of importance and I'm just going to read a few of them. There are many uses for the green space at Monterey Park and a comprehensive study should be conducted before the last vestige of developable space at Monterey Park is committed. The grassy knoll where promoters want to place their 6,000 square foot skate park is the last vestige of developable space in Monterey Park if the top lot, restrooms and picnic tables go in as proposed in the January 26, 2012 City Council meeting. Skateboarding, to me, is an activity of choice. It shouldn't be an incumbent upon the citizens of a community to provide a venue for every activity of choice, such as bowling, archery, bocce ball, golf, or horseback riding. The proposed skate park is being promoted by the skateboarding community, not the general community. 
along with family members tied to NHS Incorporated, which is a worldwide manufacturer of skateboards. Street skating, or urban skating, is everywhere as citizens witness on a daily basis. There is a plethora of signs stating no skateboards or no skateboarding around town. From my observations, a skate park does not eliminate skate street skating. It only intensifies it as a real-world challenge. Richard, you have to conclude, please. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to address the council on any issue that is not on our agenda? Okay. Um, the series tonight uh, deal with the city zoning ordinance, which, if I'm not mistaken, have not been updated for some 30 years. There's been adjustments to it over time, but uh, uh, since the last general plan, we have not um, made major changes to the zoning ordinance. Um, the Okay, you want to do that first? Yeah. Okay. It is on the agenda. Thank you, official. I'm sorry, we're going to step back one. We have an oath of office for the new planning commission, Susan <laughs> Westman. Sue, would you have the honors, please, and do that? Thank you. I'm sure Susan probably has done this multiple times, so let's face this way. Uh, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Susan Westman. I, Susan Westman. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear truth faith. That I will bear truth faith. And allegiance. And allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter upon which I'm about to enter Thank you, Thank you Susan and welcome okay. aboard you probably sat in every seat in this whole room here. Just about. Council comments. Um, we open this for council comments on any issue not on the agenda. Or, or staff comments or planning commission comments. I just, have, I just have one. For those people who are opting out of the smart meter, you got this letter, but for those of you who didn't, I just wanted you to be aware of it. Dear customer, we want you to know about a recent PUC decision that affects the number of months you will be responsible for paying the smart meter opt-out charge and how often PG&E will read the meter at your residence. We respect your choice to opt out of the smart meter program. Please note that this letter requires no action from you. The CPUC requires you to pay a $10 monthly charge to opt out of the PG&E smart meter program after you've been charged for 36 consecutive months. The charge will automatically be discontinued. You will remain enrolled in the smart meter opt-out program, but the charge will no longer appear on your bill and you will no longer be required to pay the charge for that service agreement. I'm a little flummoxed, but happy. <laughs> you will receive a reminder message on your bill after you have fulfilled the 36-month smart meter opt-out charge requirement to your service, if you move, et cetera, et cetera. Um, meter reading. Following the CPUC order, <coughs> infamous CPUC, PG&E will begin reading the meter at your residence every other month rather than monthly. You will receive an estimated bill on the months when the meter is not read manually. It is important that you provide easy access to the meter, et cetera. The new meter reading process will be implemented over the next several months. So anyway, just information for everybody in case, in case you get calls or questions about you know, the smart meter program and so forth. I'm really surprised they're dropping the fee. I thought they would probably keep that or increase it. You know, There was a... Um, $75, I think, setup charge in the very first month, and then it's just been. So we'll stay tuned to see what the CPUC is doing. Thank you, Stephanie. Sure. Anyone else? Okay, we will move to the, uh, the, the first general government hearing tonight, and that's to receive presentation regarding the City of Capitola zoning code of ordinance. I would like to set a time limit on this meeting uh, tonight to three hours, so we would like to walk out of here by 9 o'clock. Agreement? Yeah, please.
Thank you, Mayor Norton, Council Members, Planning Commissioners, and welcome, Commissioner Westman. Uh, we're excited with your appointment and look forward to working with you. Uh, as I think most of you know, the zoning code update has been on the city's to-do list for a number of years, and uh, we're very pleased to be before both of uh, the Commission and the Council this evening to kick off the process. Um, this evening, we'll go over a, a number of uh, points. Let me click through that. Um, well, I'll start with a, a brief uh, summary of the background of the process to date, go over the process and schedule that we've laid out, uh, talk a little bit about meeting and issue management, and then at that point, uh, I'll turn the presentation over to Katie, who will go over the survey results that you all completed, thank you very much, and uh, identify some issues which, based on the results, we felt were ripe for discussion tonight and possibly for early resolution. And then finally, we'll turn it back to you for discussion and direction. So as you recall, in November 2010, the city initiated a comprehensive update to its general plan, the zoning code, and to prepare the city's climate action plan, and then ultimately to codify those updates in our local coastal program update. Uh, in 2011 to 2013, uh, we had several meetings, uh, about 19, I believe, with the general plan advisory committee, had several community workshops. Uh, the focus of those meetings generally was the general plan, however, the zoning code is an implementing ordinance and we did talk um, about development standards and how some of the broad policies in the general plan would be implemented. In, in, June, of 2000, in June of 2013, at, at staff's recommendation, the city council directed staff to uh, put its focus into the general plan and place the zoning code and the climate action plan on the back burner to allow us to get through that process. Uh, from that point into the next year, um, we focused on the general plan and it was finally adopted last June. Um, and since that point, we've really turned our focus again towards resuming work on the zoning code update and the climate action plan. Um, between August and November of 2014, we did initiate or resumed our public outreach process. We held five focus group meetings with various groups of stakeholders, including residents, recent customers, property owners, um, and then just residents in general. Uh, we also had a public survey, which we were surprised. We had a pretty good response. We had over 100 responses to that. And then we conducted a number of one-on-one -on -one interviews with former staff, some of you at the table, other interested residents that couldn't meet at, make our meetings. Um, those meetings and what we heard, we used to base uh, our issues and options paper. Um, we compiled the various issues that we heard from our stakeholder, uh, did some research to find out how other similar agencies in California were dealing with comparable issues, and then we identified some potential approaches that we felt might be appropriate for Capitola. Uh, it's important to keep in mind, though, that the issues and options paper are not exhaustive. There very well could be ideas that we haven't thought of. You may have a, a different approach that would work better. Uh, we'd welcome community input or input from you all. Um, and the options that we presented oftentimes are not mutually exclusive. I think in many cases you could have a hybrid approach where you take elements of different options to find a strategy that we think would work good for us. So just a couple things to keep in mind. So the process, we, we've gone through the stakeholder and public outreach and the issues and options identification. We're now on to uh, holding a number of special meetings with the Planning Commission and City Council to wade through the 18 policy issues that we've identified. Um, once we get that policy direction, staff is going to go off with their consultants, draft a zoning code, um, and then once the draft is done, we'll bring that back through to the Planning Commission and the City Council for review. Um, at that time, we'll really get into more of the details, specific language, deciding if a regulation is a should or a shall or encourage or require and really nailed down and fine-tuned the document. Um, once, once the City Council has given us direction on a lot of the finer details of the document, uh, we will release it for public review and comment, uh, followed by adoption hearings and then, of course, a submittal of the Coastal Commission uh, to get it adopted into our LCP. So the tentative schedule right now is we've set aside six special meetings with the Planning Commission that will occur generally on Tuesdays and Thursdays between May and July. Uh, the City Council, we've tentatively scheduled four special meetings. Um, these schedules obviously can be adjusted. We expect that we will modify them as we proceed to see how fast we're moving through it. Hopefully we don't need as many meetings, but if we need more, we can certainly accommodate that as well. 
Um, we are going to try to um, start meetings at 6 p.m. and end no later than 10, hopefully by 9, but um, staff would certainly be flexible to go a little longer if that's the desire of the Commission and Council. All the meetings will be standard uh, procedure. We'll publicly notice them. They'll be televised and we will maintain and update a schedule on the city website so that residents can stay updated if the schedule does get adjusted along the way. So just to touch on kind of some meeting and issue management, um, there is a lot of content to go through, so I thought it would be um, worthy of just discussing that, you know, our expectation or our hope is to get high-level policy direction, not to get uh, the, the fine level details, the language at this juncture. Uh, there's plenty of time to work through that and our concern is that if we try to tackle some of those finer details at this point, we'll kind of get bogged down and, and we'll lose schedule. Um, with, with all that, I think it's, it's going to be incumbent to manage meetings pretty efficiently to try to say your piece and once we recognize that a consensus is reached, move on. Um, and, you know, I think it's also important to keep in mind that this is not the final opportunity um, to talk about any of these issues. Um, it's not out of the realm of possibilities that an issue or two may be particularly challenging. And in those cases, I think it's perfectly acceptable to give staff preliminary direction. Um, and someone could always change their mind. Um, once we talk about it more, perhaps somebody changes their mind and we go in a slightly different direction. That's okay. There's opportunity for that. So I don't want anyone to think that if they make a decision now that that's it, it's set in stone. Obviously, we don't want to make too many back and forth changes, but that we can certainly accommodate some of that. We are flexible. So we did give, uh, distribute a preliminary survey uh, to all the council members and uh, planning commissioners last month. Um, and for the public's benefit, this survey was just to give a preliminary idea of where the various council and planning commissioners sat on an issue before we waded through and, and discussed all the issues. Um, certainly folks are, are more than welcome to change their minds as they go through it. It was just simply intended to identify issues for us that perhaps don't require a lot of discussion so that we can streamline the process as we move through the meetings. Um, the survey results that we saw suggest that there are some areas that have substantial agreement. Um, so this evening what we intend to do is uh, present, Katie will present some of the results to you and uh, some of the issues that we think may be ready to uh, resolve this evening, at least on a preliminary level, and then we'll turn it over to you to you know, give us some direction and we'll be available for questions. And with that, I will turn it over to Katie. Okay, thank you. Um, welcome, Commissioner Westman. Nice to have you here. Um, first, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to do the survey and complete it for us. Um, your answers are definitely not binding and likely in some instances will change over time, but they are very valuable to us in separating the general, the areas of general agreement to the, with the, from the larger issues. There are 18 issues included in the issues and options report. The focus tonight on the discussion will be those issues that in which we receive general guidance. Within two of the issues, there was 60 to 80 percent agreement towards the desired option. I will discuss the findings of these two issues first. They include signs and also um, maintaining and enhancing the village character. There were also four issues that there was um, direction to change from the existing, but the two bodies did not had different preferences on the desired outcome. The four are now shown on the screen. Um, Tonight, I'll provide an overview of each issue listed on this slide, the options that were suggested within the issues and options report, and then the survey results. Following my overview of each issue, we'd like to open the conversation for discussion. Um, at that point, I'll request that Mayor Norton begin the discussion between the Planning Commission and the City Council and also open the opportunity for the public to comment on issues. Um, as you discuss each of the issues, we'd like to hear if there is consensus to remove any of the issues from the list of 18 issues. We've identified the six issues that we think the survey gave us enough information to start moving forward towards um, drafting an ordinance. Um, once we begin drafting the ordinance and getting into the specifics, then you'll have the opportunity to review these issues again and let us know if there are areas that you'd like removed or how you'd like them 
modified. So this is not the last time you'll see these issues in front of you. Um, following the discussion on the six issues tonight, you will have the opportunity to discuss any other issues you'd like to bring forward. And we'll see what time it is at that point. <laughs> Um, at this point, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. If not, I'll proceed. Is there questions to staff on, on the, the, okay. the process or the first discussions? No? Okay. Okay, well, we'll jump into issue number two, maintaining and enhancing the village character. Um, we'll begin each issue with a discussion on the current code and option one will always be to maintain the existing code. Um, the Central Village Zone currently states that all development standards for the Central Village District are contained in the adopted Central Village Design Guidelines, so the two documents are very well connected. This, the Central Village Design Guidelines were adopted in 1987 and contain design guidelines for site planning, building design, landscaping, signs, and parking in the village. Um, the central design guidelines go beyond the typical guidance and include numerous statements of mandatory statements typically found in a zoning ordinance. Um, we'd like to fix this in the future and have the regulations should be within the code and guidelines should be more um, guidance rather than policy. Um, so to fix this, we've come up with four options. The first is to maintain the existing standards. Oops, sorry. The second option is to create new building form and character standards. The, some of these are such as maximum setbacks to keep buildings and their entrances close to sidewalks. Um, also option three is to incorporate standards from the guidelines, so to remove the reference from the central village and actually incorporate those standards into the guidelines. And then option four was for other. This next slide shows um, the results of the survey. There was a preliminary direction from both bodies to establish building form and character standards. There was also direction to include some of the design guidelines as standards. These two preferred options can be combined to create a new form and character standards that incorporate appropriate um, standards from the guideline. So, Mayor, I'll now turn this over for you for discussion. Questions to staff on uh, issue number two. Um, I have one, Katie. Sure. Uh, is, is the design standards going to be established within the zoning ordinance or is it going to be a separate document? It will be within the zoning ordinance. So before we're through this process, we will have to do a, create a village design standard. Is that correct? The, um, the standards would be within the central village zone, and they would be standards that are, so it's not a separate document. It's, um, they're, they're more when they talk about where the building placement would be, um, the relationship of like front entrances to sidewalks, um, permitted treatments within setback areas such as plazas. Um, so that would be built right into the development standards of the zone. Okay. Thank you. Ed? So when we were um, choosing a consultant for the general plan process, we had three or four different firms that came here and we spent a day interviewing them and asking them questions and getting their views on things. One thing that came through very clearly with all of them was that the, the trend is to something called form-based zoning. And it kind of got dropped after that And until uh, I saw this. Is this sort of where this is going, this uh, number two option? It's not quite to the standard of a form-based zone. A form-based zone will um, take your whole um, it'll be a form-based zone really looks at form, but it also creates dif for different areas of different zones. There's transects, so it would divide all your zoning different, um, like your single-family neighborhoods and your central village and along 41st into different transects and use this form in place. That's very zoning-esque. So this, what they're proposing to do is more, I think, a hybrid approach of just utilizing more um, form and development standards only within the central village because it is such a um, place as everything in the central village and in the built environment is very unique. So 
it's really a pedestrian area in which the buildings are close to the road, so it is an appropriate place in which to incorporate some of these um, form-based standards. So in general, that was kind of a trendy thing back, what was it, three or four years ago that uh, we did those interviews and that we're kind of moving away from that a little bit with what you're going to be proposing in terms of a code. I, uh, Mr. Newman, I, I think, you know, Katie said it correctly, it's sort of a hybrid approach. I think if you look at our Central Village design guidelines, they are more kind of based on form than they are numeric standards, which you had seen a traditional zoning code. Um, the problem from my perspective is right now we have a zoning code that says you shall comply with the guidelines, which makes them mandatory standards. And it creates problems because sometimes those guidelines really don't work in a specific situation. So I think my recommendation coming out of this is that we, we identify those standards that we think are important and we put those in an ordinance so that they're mandatory requirements. And those things that we have some flexibility and that are more guidance, we leave in guidelines and those are kind of should standards. Um, I think that would be the approach to take on it and we'll certainly have to wade through and decide what are those things that move into standards. Council members and commissioners, for what it's worth, about a decade ago I actually followed a similar process for a downtown area and this was exactly the solution we ended on, kind of a hybrid form of the form-based code. In general, form-based codes sort of have more application, in my opinion, to a downtown area than they do to residential areas or maybe the more regional commercial areas on 41st Avenue. So the recommendation from the Planning Commission is one that I certainly saw implemented in another community basically a hybrid form-based code for the downtown area. Jackson, Stephanie? Just, just that, the issue that I brought up some time ago um, when I was first on the council and we were talking about the village, I s had said, um, do we have a, any sort of guidelines for what percentage commercial and what percentage residential? And we didn't really, and I think we were, I think we were going to look, look that up and see if whether we had any guidelines for that, because I thought we did, we had some guidelines, maybe Susan could help. I thought it was about 50-50, because we were, st at that time in the 80s, late 80s, we were starting to see some change, some people wanting to make some changes in the village, and so we needed to talk about how much residential, how much commercial, you know, and it's not really a neighborhood anymore. It's, it is, but it's more for weekend people that are just there partying and having a great time. I mean, it used to be, we used to have hundreds of people live down there year round. And I'd be real curious to know how many now. But anyway, just, just in some point, let's talk about that mix, you know, at uh, what, what we would like to see somewhere down the road when we get further down. Um, if we want to have a rule or regulation or, we don't gu not a, or a guideline of whatever, 40, 60, 60, 40, 50, 50, what, whatever we want. But let's look at it, see what we have, see what we want to go in the future. Uh, so I think you identify what I was thinking of. Um, some of the uh, guidelines or some of the forms or whatever you want to call it. So I don't know if that's going to be an ex um, basically really reflective of what we have. So when it comes back, you know, maybe some educational material, this is sort of what you're thinking about. And I remember reading that list and I walked around and I said, oh, okay, I can see why you came up with that list. I just don't want to exclude other possibilities for people that want to improve their property. And I did actually vote for option three, and the reason why is because I thought it would be easier to implement, a little bit easier from the planning standpoint. So um, when you talk about a hybrid, how, how can we get the ease in there also? Because I know that's one of the things that sort of permeated the survey and, you know, the things that we were asked to think about. So I think, you know, a, a traditional zoning code is, you know, they're, they're based more on strict numeric standards, you know, what's your height, what's your setbacks, what's your lock coverage, floor area ratio, those things. When you have form-based code, you're looking more at things like, for example, uh, requiring that an entry be at a sidewalk, that you have a certain percentage of a window for retail space, um, that a building be oriented towards the street and that if there is parking, it be in the rear of the lot so that you have a more inviting public realm. Uh, things of that nature, which I think are used widely now in California, particularly in these downtown type village areas, and I think would work well in Capitola. Um, a lot of those are now in the guidelines and through the zoning code, how it's written, or the requirements, but it's, it's a clumsy way to do it and it's difficult to administer currently. Linda, go ahead. So I just want to clarify that what, what we're really talking about with 
option number two is a direction for staff to go off and write the, the detail. Mm -hmm. And the devil's in the detail, but the detail would all come back. That's so right. the, the input is good, but I think um, for purposes of this discussion, it's the direction really that we're, we're looking at as a, as a consensus. Yes, and, and we'll go to that right away. If we have consensus now, we'll move along yeah. with this. Uh, um, and th this is necessary uh, discussion at this point. We'll, we, if we have some some s strong agreement that <coughs> that we would like to see staff to take this direction, um, somebody make a motion that way, and we'll we'll go forward. Um, I do have a comment, and then I'd like to make a motion. Um, I'd just like to um, comment on Stephanie's uh, comments about the the mix between residential and commercial. And I agree with her. That is something that I think we need to look at. It, it, it's something that um, do we want it all to be one way, you know, just for vacationers? Do we miss the fact that we don't have residents as much? I mean, I don't know how many are down there, actually. But I think it's something we should look at. I'd like to make a motion to accept this guideline. Do we, do we, have, we have enough discussion yet for a motion? I haven't heard from everybody. I'd like, like to hear from everybody first. Okay. Well, I'll make the motion. If there's a second, then we'll have discussion I've on the motion. For, I've asked for a comment from everyone. And so at this point, we've we got to move it through this way. It's all going to come back to us two or three times. We all have a chance to review this again. It just gives staff direction that on item number two that we, we accept the, the, t the task and how that they can move forward at this point. That's what we're looking at. So I made the so motion. The, so the form-based code includes incorporating the guidelines into the zoning ordinance so someone doesn't have to deal with two separate documents when they come in. That's exactly right. And that would be the basis that we would use to you know, develop kind of those form standards or what's in the existing guidelines now that we like and we think works effectively. And we'll highlight those things when we come back that we put in there and maybe things we didn't and why and okay. give you an opportunity to tell us if we got it right or not. I think that's great. That's good. Okay, we have a motion to move forward on it. I'll second, and, and just to, to, on top of that, it, I, I picked uh, option two, and the reason I didn't weigh in on this is that I think that's fine, and I, I think this can be one of the easier ones we're going to talk about, and uh, you know, and then there'll be there'll probably be more lively discussion, but uh, fine with option two. Thank you, Katie. You have a, you have our on it. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Do we need a vote? I don't know. We vote. We have a consensus. Oh, okay. Cool. I think a consensus is yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. just feel it that way. Okay. The second issue is issue 7A for signs. Within signs, there's um, three different parts to the signs uh, of issues within signs. I'm going to discuss the first two together. Um, the first option, um, the first issue was sign thresholds. Currently, all sign permits for new signs other than replacing an existing sign um, go before the Planning Commission. The cost to an applicant is approximately $700 unless it's appealed. Um, then the, the time and cost goes up. Um, we've heard through our stakeholders that the they'd rather have stricter regulations with more predictability of what should what is expected rather than going to the planning commission and um, spending se the cost of a sign on the review process so within this option we have option one to keep the existing regulations and all new sign permits would go before the planning commission um, option two is um, a result of what we heard from the stakeholders and past practices from other cities. Um, st stakeholders um, within this option, there be stricter standards subject to staff level review with the option to go beyond those standards uh, um, to be reviewed by planning commission. Um, within that option also, the standards would be well illustrated and, well def and clearly defined. So the expectation from the planning commission when they walk by, there would be no surprises of what was allowed and um, of course, if it was any larger, it could go before the Planning Commission for approval. And then option three is other. Um, we heard clear consensus on this for option two, and that would be, again, the administrative review with stricter, well-defined, and well-illustrated development standards for signs, and then to go beyond, it would go to Planning Commission. So um, with that, Mayor Norton, I'll... Uh, the discussion on the sign issue. Susan? 
Well, I'm very much in favor of having staff have more authority to approve signs, particularly with these stricter standards. I've seen so much time wasted on the applicant's part as well as our staff's time on sign applications that did not need to go to the Planning Commission. So I think the approach they've come up with is a real good one. Yep. <coughs> so I, I voted for that also, but I, <coughs> I did have reservations when I did so because uh, sometimes I've sat on the Planning Commission, and one happened recently actually with regard to the Margaritaville sign, where a sign came through and it looked fine, and then all of a sudden some commissioners came up with some great concerns, and we kind of kicked it around a little bit, and we ended up with something different than would have been approved by the staff in that case. So uh, that, that was my reservation, but I still sort of agree with what Susan had to say. Maybe we'll have to just suffer that loss. Mm -hmm. What would you have done with the Takaria Agave sign? <laughs> I don't know if you knew, it was across the street. I mean, th I voted against it. I, I didn't think it was up to our standards. It was a sign. It was wooden. It had paint on it. You know, that's it's there. It's you, know, you don't have to answer the question. It, but it, it's um, that was a matter. If, for those of you who remember the sign, I don't think it was what we should have approved, but we did, it was there, they're gone, we don't have to look at it anymore. But I just bring it up, we have to be careful. We want to have good quality, good quality, and so if we can build, somehow build that into the standard of no schlocky signs, no tacky signs, I don't know, we'll figure out some description, I don't know how we do it, I'm happy to let them do it. I just don't want that, that kind of a sign approved because I think it was, it, we could have had a little bit better. I know they didn't want to spend a lot of time on it, I mean, a lot of money on it, and I, you know, I appreciate that. It was a new business and everything, but we want to have quality. I think you, you kind of, you know, nailed the, the, nailed it on the head. I think, you know, the trick is going to be to develop prescriptive standards that don't leave a lot of room for discretion, so that somebody looks at it and we can all basically interpret it the same way, um, so that we issue a permit if it complies, and if it doesn't, then it does go to a hearing body. Um, right now, I don't think our standards are all that well defined. Um, but if we can do a good job in that, I think we can achieve high quality designs without really sacrificing, uh, you know, the process at all. I would agree with uh, Commissioner Westman that uh, we try to give more authority to staff to, uh, to take care of these issues and one, to make it easier for those people trying to get through the process and uh, two, not to, you know, eat up a lot of time in that. Um, and I also, you know, I, I remember the um, discussion we had that uh, Commissioner Newman was talking about with the Margarita sign, but I think maybe in that uh, process of the Central Village um, come with the new zoning and, and the form we discussed, <coughs> that some of those things probably could be laid out that if it goes above and beyond that, uh, maybe we, you know, we'd come back to the Planning Commission, but I think uh, in that um, element uh, that we're ta talking about discussing and updating that village design area that we could probably eliminate a lot of those discussions coming back to the Planning Commission. <clears throat> yeah, I, I too have picked option two, and I, I think that the, the, the city is doing a great job of regulating, especially the newer signs that are coming out. I think maybe the Margaritaville is an anomaly. Uh, my one concern is that I, I do believe that the fee, I think for the Planning Commission fee, it was about $750, and in some cases it went up to $1,500, $1,800 in, in extreme cases. But on the other hand, I, I, I think that since planning or, uh, is going to be spending more time on this, I think the, the, the base fee right now is something around $150. Mm -hmm. There should be some increase in that fee schedule. I don't know if this comes in at this time, but I think we should look at if we're going to do these over the counter and we're going to expect staff to do a little bit more time, there should be some, some, some increase in that fee. That's my only input there. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Katie, a lot of the fees based on the fact that you, you have to take it through a process with the Planning Commission. Yeah, the, amount of time, the, time it's the amount of time that we spend. That we bill so hourly. I'm not so sure that there's more work when you and don't And there's a noticing fee. So mm -hmm. when when a sign application comes in in the village, it's uh, $279 just because it's in the coastal area and is noticed in the newspaper. So there's differentiation on costs based on the area of town. But and, and I would add, you know, right now, if uh, you come in for a sign permit and it's a deposit and we bill you based on the amount of time staff spend. So we spend more effort going to a planning commission preparing, the cost is going to go up. I think ideally we'd like to do, not as part of this process, but when we update our fee schedule, is convert a lot of those deposits, particularly for simple permit types, 
in the flat fees. So there's cost certainty. Somebody comes to the counter, they know what they're going to pay. And it's not open-ended. And <coughs> making changes so that there's not uh, the uncertainty with a planning commission hearing will, I think, allow us to do that with, uh, you know, more precision. I mean, I, I was just thinking of a, another example where the planning commission really made a, a difference on a sign. Excuse me. In addition to the one that um, Commissioner, um, yeah, Ed, <laughs> that Ed was talking about, um, and it was more a cosmetic, a design issue. And so I'd like to see with the standards and with that delegation, maybe they spend their money on making sure they've got some professional design input because you get higher quality designs that way. So mm -hmm. just like to throw that out there. Okay. So clearly, uh, Katie, describe what this proposal is by staff. The proposal by staff is um, that we heard from you was uh, to allow an administrative review within stricter standards. The standards have to have connection to quality standards to ensure that the designs are quality designs pr that look professional. And that is doable. We can talk about materials and incorporating relief within um, signs. And there's plenty of good examples out there to get that to that quality. And then also if an applicant like Toyota wanted to go beyond the maximum limitations as we've seen recently in an application, they could go to the Planning Commission and have that reviewed. Thank you. Is there a consensus here? To move that Is it appealable? Yes. Yes. Okay. We have consensus. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next was tailored sign standards. Within this option, right now our sign code is divvied up between, um, it is not differentiated between areas of town other than the um, sidewalk signs within the central village. Um, within this option, the exist, um, option two, we would create tailored standards for the different commercial areas. So within the village, we've talked about the pedestrian orientation and how um, this, the signs in the village are very different from the signs you see along Auto Plaza Drive or 41st or within our industrial area. So with an option to it would be to create tailored standards for each of those commercial areas. Um, and then the third option was for any um, suggestions you may have had. There was um, very clear direction provided from the City Council. There was an 80% preference towards option two and the planning commission had 100 percent um, consensus towards option two with um, an added comment that there's concern except for those uh, signs being reviewed within the central village. So thank you. Katie. Thank you. Questions of staff? Josh? Um, yeah, I was just concerned about the comment from city council about uh, backlighting on signs in the um, um, any explanation and just trying to understand that where that might have come from have we had some issues on that and could you um, state the exact comment the uh, comment is sign approval should not go to the Planning Commission backlighting on signs and neon are not bad things this was made on the fourth um, 423 so I think that's clearly stating a preference for the previous issue to not have all signs go before Planning Commission and then also stating a preference towards lighting with signs and within each of the tailored standards I think we'll, we'll look at lighting relative to different areas because uh, lighting in the village will be and along the neighborhood commercial areas will be very different from lighting along say Auto Plaza Drive or 41st. Okay. And also I remember when uh, Target had its sign that was very glowing at night. So some of these signs may affect the neighbors and so maybe that should be in that also. Yeah, I, I think the example of Target would be a great example of one that would definitely go before Planning Commission due to the location of Target. Okay. It's very high on the building, we'll probably have height standards. Um, so at that, that we'd have the review by the Planning Commission. Also, a master sign plan would also still go before the Planning Commission for review when you have um, a sign plan for a larger development okay. or a mixed development. And, and we also intend to uh, add some standards for lighting, so to prevent light trespass, have a, a lumen threshold, a limit, and have 
applicants with lit signs come in and demonstrate that the light's going to be confined to their property. We don't have that today. Um, where does the issue of uh, sidewalk signs fit in, or does that come when we have a <laughs> detail? <laughs> That's not an issue. Well, the issue of sidewalk signs, I think we talk about every year or two. Um, <laughs> a couple times since I've been here, and I'm I sure Susan's gone times. through those discussions many times. Um, we didn't identify it as a specific issue. I think it was last spring we went to the city council. We talked about it again. City council mm -hmm. advised us at that time to keep the rules as they are. There's a an approved sign design that a merchant can apply for, and that's it. The, I, I don't think there is a legal sandwich board sign down in the village today. Certainly, if there is a desire to change that, we, we would be willing to do that as well. I, I just wanted to say that just we need to be really careful in the future about not loosening our sign ordinance too much. One of the things that we did that really set us apart from the rest of the county was have a really good strict sign ordinance. So our signs were smaller. We didn't allow as many. People had to take them down. And there was an immediate effect over the community that didn't look so junky. And so when you go to other communities, they have different sizes, different colors, different shapes, on this wall, on this wall, on this wall, high and low everywhere. And we don't have that, and we don't want to go back to that. So I think we really want to be careful in giving any exceptions to any you know, businesses on 41st Avenue, because um, they'll ask for it. They've always asked for it. They want more. They want bigger. They want and we let them have it with the mattress store, and I think that was a mistake by having them have bigger letters. They don't need that. You know, our, our community needs to be protected, commercial area, residential area, industrial area, all of it, and from it, something that is, is going to be unattractive like that. So when it comes back, we just want to be, I think, cautious and careful that we don't expand it so that it turns out to be something that, um, that we're going to regret later on by the public looking at it and say, "Oh, how did that, you know? How did that get? How did that get approved?" Thank you, Stephanie. I'm, I'm going to follow up on what you just said, Stephanie. In, in 1984, I was a planning commissioner in the city. Susan was the planning director, <laughs> and we there was a subcommittee of this planning commission to do a sign ordinance, and we basically tackled all the whole city. But the, um, the main point was to tackle 41st Avenue. At the time, there was, a, there was a number of monument signs all up and down that strip there. 41st Avenue did not look like it did today. It does today. And that sign ordinance has really worked because we're down to really one, one height monument sign in the whole 41st Cat corridor. That's the, that's the theater sign. It's the only one that's left signed there. And the reason that happens is because of a good sign ordinance. And you're exactly right, Stephanie. The strict, strict restrictions put everybody down to the eight-foot height limit on, on monument signs down there, and it really pays off on the visual character of that avenue today. So it was a good decision and should stay with us. Susan? Okay. Um, do we have consensus that uh, staff should um, move yes, forward with yes. it? Okay. okay. That was a great lead into the next one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> issue 7C, Monument Signs. So the existing regulations are, as Dennis just, um, as Councilmember Norton, or Mayor Norton just suggested, there's, you're allowed to have one monument sign per development, so for, per property. Um, that one sign is limited to four tenants, and there's height restrictions of up to <coughs> eight feet. Um, we heard from the stakeholders, specifically um, at Kings Plaza, um, the Owl property, that in, in that location they have a long um, frontage along 41st, I think it's greater than 800 feet linear, linear feet along the street, and that being restricted to one monument sign, really they have to play preference with four tenants in the plaza, and because the buildings are set so far back, it's hard to um, let people know from the street what they have within the plaza. So hearing from our stakeholder groups, we created the following options. The first is to keep the existing as it is today and has been successful. Um, the second is to limit based on a linear frontage along the street. So for those properties that have more um, like linear frontage, so Begonia Plaza has a smaller frontage where King's Plaza is probably three times as long. So um, if they were to have a longer linear frontage to allow more. Um, the uh, third option was to allow more than four tenants on the sign. And then option four was to look at the master sign plan 
uh, language and clarify that a monument sign, when looked within a master sign plan, um, there can be more discretion based on lot size, the number of tenants, and the front edge of the property. Um, here are the results. There was direction towards keeping the existing regulations as well as updating the master sign plan. So as you can see, the majority was with, um, for city council was split between options one and four. There was um, a majority of planning commissioners for option four to keep discretion within the master sign plan. But there was also 40% of planning commissioners that said, let's leave this the way in which it is. Um, this is not an easy issue. It may, if, if tonight isn't the proper time to discuss this, we can come back during the other meetings um, and follow through with this. But for now, with what, I'm, with what we have seen, we could take a hybrid approach we can leave the existing regulations for anyone that wants to come in and do an over-the-counter permit for a monument sign and they would be tied to the regulations as they are today or they would have the option to come forth to the planning commission with within a master sign plan and show the planning commission what they're opting for if it's two monument signs and then the planning commission would have the discretion to allow that second monument sign. So. Um, that's the hybrid that we have that we could move forward with tonight. If this issue is worthy of more discussion, we should come back to you with it at another time. Thank you. Um, I, I have a suggestion on this one, and that is that um, I think it's great that we're going to come up with sign regulations for the various <laughs> commercial districts because right now the monument sign regulations you have apply whether someone's putting up a monument sign on Capitola Road, someone's putting up a monument sign on 41st Avenue. So before we make these decisions about how many tenants should be on there, how many monument signs someone should have, I think you need to come back to us with your suggested sign regulations for that commercial district and then the monument sign will fit into the context of what's going on in that district. So I, I think it's a little early to be making decisions until we see how the sign regulations are going to work out for the various commercial areas. And I would, I would agree completely with that in that um, the devil's in the details, but the details are going to come back. So if, if that's the details that we need to see, then really it doesn't have to stay. We're not, we're not debating the direction. We're just debating the devil's in the details. So it will come back that way, which means that we could remove it from the list of 18 at this point and then bring it back around. One other thing I did want to comment, though, is the um, gas price signs being digitized. I think in the new regulations we need to allow that. I mean, we have one example of it and I think it's worked out beautifully. Um, up on 41st, people can read it from a distance. It, I think it, it's much less of a traffic hazard than the old, you know, paper signs mm -hmm. and, and stuff. So those are my comments. Thank you. I'm good. Um, the, the problem I had with option number four about uh, clarifying di discretion and monument signs is that I really didn't understand what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very vague to me, and so I, I don't think we do have a consensus here because we really don't know it yet what we're really talking about. Can we give staff some kind of direction as what we're leaning towards? In other words, can we give them some direction that if we if we want to come back with the monument signs, let's give them that. But what what to bring back? We're going to look at the details again, no matter what on this. It isn't like it, it's it's done. So is there some direction we can give them as, as to what we would like to see them bring back? Well, as, as I mentioned, my direction would be different depending on where the sign was going to go because I would say to them for signs that are going to be on uh, Capitola Road, um, then um, 
You know, I don't think we want monument signs to be any taller. I don't think you need to have more tenants on them. I don't, um, in 41st Avenue, I have different feelings about that. And so that was why I was asking for them to give us uh, a draft of the sign regulations that they're going to propose for those various areas so we can tailor monument signs to fit into each one of those areas because I don't think we want the same monument sign regulation citywide. Okay. Is that clear enough for staff to, to, to actually take one? It is. Yeah. Is there consensus to go along with Susan's recommendation? Yes. Okay, you mm -hmm. have consensus on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next issue is issue 14, environmental and hazard overlays. Uh, the major problem here is that our current code has five existing overlays that are difficult to navigate due to sections being scattered throughout the code and the area of the overlays being within descriptions rather than identified within the zoning map. The options presented were option one to maintain the existing overlays. Option two is to reorganize the overlay sections within the code. In this option, we would keep overlays that are necessary, um, remove the unnecessary overlays, um, and to move the floodplain regulations to Title 15 as the building official is the administrator of floodplain regulations. The third option creates a new consolid consolidated environmental overlay. Within options two and three, we're not proposing any changes to the standards within the overlays. It's just whether or not they're applicable and how they're organized. Um, we heard consensus not to go forward with the way things have been. It's time to make it more understandable for the public and staff and the commission and board and council. Um, the City Council gave 80% direction towards option two. Planning Commission gave 60% uh, direction towards option three. Um, I think this one is more of an administrative issue and Rich and I can work closely on this one to come up with an ag the agreeable solution to make sure that one, it's reorganized for clarity so it's easier to utilize for the public and staff and also um, identifying these overlays within maps rather than having descriptions within the code. So um, that's our recommendation of best practices. Questions to staff, Josh? Right, so, hmm. questions to staff. Okay, my, my main concern is the ease in uh, using this. So from your, uh, I don't know if it's appropriate, but uh, Rich or Kate, which is the easier to do, two or three? You know, I don't have a strong preference one way or another. I think if I had to pick, though, I would say two. And an example would be, you know, right now we have an archaeological uh, overlay zone. Um, the requirement of that overlay zone is basically that you comply with CEQA and you evaluate the potential to find buried histor historic or prehistoric resources, and then you implement mitigation measures. I think that could just as easily be written in a couple paragraphs in the code than having this kind of secretive overlay layer that most of the public doesn't understand and simply refer to a map. Um, but there's, there's, you know, the other way would probably work equally as well. So uh, I, we I just think the problem right now is we have a lot of overlays that overlap, they're scattered, they're not well codified. Uh, it's difficult for us at times, cause, so I can only imagine what it's like for the public. Mm. Well, you have that issue when you, when you buy a house too, they want, you know, the mortgage broker wants you know, to get you to buy a copy of the floodplain map, and I said I don't need one. I just go down to the city, and, and you know, we have them down there. So, I agree. Whatever is easiest for you to work with, for the public to work with, we've sort of had this system too for a while. We have these maps and so forth, and but whatever, yeah, whatever you think would work. It seems to me that the creating a new overlay seems like a lot more work. But whatever you think would um, would be easiest um, for the public and for everyone to work with. Is all the overlays on our GIS system? They, they can be. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I don't know for sure. My guess is no. That may be one you know, we still have some maps from the 70s and 80s that we have to pull out and refer to every now and again. And the boundaries are a little bit unclear. They've been copied 20 times. It's, it's not easy to administer at times. Is that some of the work? I know AMBAG makes some 
time available to they do, do. Mm-hmm. we ever I know there's a limit of how much time we can access them but have we tapped yeah we've them? actually used them recently to help us uh, do some mapping for the zoning code okay. updates some of the upcoming meetings so we would try to use that resource as it's available is there a consensus among us to uh, have staff move move forward on this? I have no problem. Yeah, okay. I think we do. Okay. Okay. Thank Two you. Two or three. Okay. okay. This is another more administrative, but um, permits and approvals. So within Capitola's zoning code currently, there are over 20 different types of permits and approvals, such as use permits, conditional use permits, design permits, and variances. Um, staff expects that most of these will remain unchanged within the zoning code update. However, there is an opportunity to simplify, clarify, and generally improve the types of permits required and make it simpler when um, the public comes to the front counter. In particular, using more general types of permits for a range of specific land use actions could simplify the code for the staff and applicants. There's also a need um, we could reduce the amount of permits. Um, and reduce administrative issues. So within this option, the first option was to maintain the existing permits as they are today. Um, and then we broke up three different categories of permits. The first would be the new administrative permit. Um, this is for fence uh, examples that could be included within a new administrative permit is fences, temporary signs, temporary sidewalk sales, and temporary storage. Those are currently permitted over the counter. Um, but when someone looks at the code and they realize that it's under the heading administrative permit, it's easier for them to identify what the exact process is. Um, and then option 2B was ne- um, new minor use permits for, it would be an administrative action, so staff would take action on it, but there would be public noticing. And examples that would fit under this category are home occupancy permits, transient occupancy, sorry, occupancy permits. Um, So currently when a a, um, member of the public wants to start a home occupation, they do come in, they fill out a permit. We notice all residents within 100 feet or property owners within 100 feet of a home occupancy. Um, And then the third of this section was a new substantial conformance process. And this was to, um, we've had a series of issues of when a member of the public is working on a project that's been approved by the Planning Commission that at times they'll make changes in the field and not understand clearly that um, they have to come in and have uh, staff review the changes prior to making them in the field and staff determine whether or not if it's a minor change to a window or a change to all exterior materials what process that needs to go through. By creating a new substantial conformance process um, that's outlined for within the code for the general public to understand that they have to follow this new substantial conformance process prior um, so that there's stricter standards um, prior to making changes out in the field and that's better outlined within the code. So those are the three options. Um, what we heard from both um, from the city council was Um, support towards the first two administrative permits and then um, a lot of 100% support towards that substantial compliance. Um, So um, from the Planning Commission there was support for the minor, I'm sorry, um, let me, for the minor use permit but not as much support for the new administrative permit and I think that might have been just possibly by how it was written within the issues and options so I'd appreciate discussion on that and then also um, not as much support for the substantial conformance process. So with that, Mayor Norton. Thank you, TJ. Yeah, I actually support uh, 2A, 2B and 2C. I, I, I really am in favor of trying to uh, empower our staff to make those type of decisions until it's something that's necessary maybe outside of the box that come back to the Planning Commission so um, I support all three of those uh, permit processes and and uh, trust the staff to make good decisions and then those things that would be uh, different substantially different that could come back to the Planning Commission yeah. so 
I thought this um, question was, or I was confused. Two A, B, and C aren't mutually exclusive, and I'm not sure I really got that at the time. I mean, they really, you, some people voted for all of them, I think, and that makes sense, really, when you get down to it. And that's the way, it, but the others weren't presented that way, so when I got to this one, I kind of got thrown. Mm -hmm. So I want to uh, retract my votes and start over <laughs> on this. <one. laughs> I thought I could only vote for one. Yeah. I didn't know I could vote for that was more, confusing. Than, more than the others. So. I think we recognized that after we got the results, and we looked at it and said, oh. Yeah. yeah, that wasn't worded really well. Apologies. Yeah. Well, I'll go along with TJ's. And on um, 2B, in terms of the notification, 100 feet's not very much. Uh, why shouldn't it be 200 or 300? Or um, the neighbors want to know for certain kinds of modifications or permit applications what's going on. I think it's come here a couple of times when people have said at public. Um, comment that they were notified about things and um, so is there a rationale for 100 feet as opposed to 200 or 300? That's the current standard that's in the code. I, I really don't know what the rationale was used when it was uh, developed um, but I could speculate that you know our standard for uh, your major project is 300 feet and the idea was probably that these are more minor project types that would have less opportunity to affect residents and a little further out um, besides the immediate neighbors. Um, but certainly that's a number that we can play with. We can make it the standard 300 or 200, whatever we'd like. Yeah, I was just trying to get the rationale. If it's really minor, I could see just 100 or so, but... That's you know, for instance, home occupation permits, we do notice within 100 feet, and the home occupation standards are that, you know, you can't have any guests come to the door, you can't do something that produces obnoxious odors or noises. So if you meet that criteria, the idea is you're not going to be affecting a lot of your neighbors. Um, so I think, you know, a, a smaller noticing radius would be warranted, but if we want to take that precaution and go further, that, that's fine too. I don't, I, I don't recall ever having a problem with that, that where people came in afterwards and said, you know, why wasn't I notified about this kind of thing? I think that you're right. The nature of these applications are so minor and innocuous that they are not going to disturb anybody that's not right next door. There is a provision in there also that if there is an issue, it can be brought before the Planning Commission. Is everyone clear what, the, what we're discussing here? Would, you want to, would anyone like a, dis, a description from staff is actually what, what we're proposing? Okay. I'm, just, I'm just curious, are we talking about A, B, and 2A, B, and C and having a consensus that they can hybrid those three together and move forward? That's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay. Good. I agree. Okay. 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 We have consensus then. Okay. So I will add 2A also. To but, but do we also, I don't think we need to change the numbers. I think the, the noticing is fine as it is. We're, yeah. we're okay with that. <coughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to start, begin our discussion on design permits. This is applicable design permits are applicable to commercial properties as well as residential properties. I'd like to start the conversation um, specifically geared towards commercial design permits. The code currently requires design permits for all tenant modifications including a principally permitted use. Um, this is burdensome for new businesses that choose to relocate to Capitola due to the amount of time it takes to get before both boards, the Arkansas site and then the Planning Commission. So to be clear, if you have a principally permitted use um, and you're going to take over a tenant space, it would require going before both of those boards. Um, to, If it were a conditional use permit, it would definitely go to the Planning Commission no matter what because that use is tied to possible impacts. So, um, But we're speaking just about the design permit. So within the options, the first option was to maintain the existing threshold. So whenever there's a tenant change, it would require a design permit and it would go before the Arkansas Site and Planning Commission. Option two is to only require a design permit when there are exterior modifications to a commercial building. Option three is to only require a design permit when there, it's a larger project within a commercial building and the example we gave was uh, Santa Cruz uses a similar standard for an addition up to 25 percent and then it would go to Planning Commission and then option four was just asking for other 
direction. Um, the survey again told us not to continue with business as usual. Um, there was a preference by the city council to only require when there is a larger project and there was preference by the planning commission to only require commercial design permit if exterior modifications are proposed. Um, what we took from these results is that commercial buildings, a commercial building that is not making exterior modifications does not require, should not require a design permit. I'm going to lead into the next question before discussion because it's applicable. Um, the next question that we asked was for the preferred review authority for commercial design permits. The first option was to maintain the existing review authority and all modifications to commercial, no matter the size or um, extent, would go before planning commission. Option two creates a limited authority by the director and that's similar to how residential standards are set up. Um, and then lastly, the option of other to hear additional suggestions. Um, within the survey, we saw results that both bodies would like to create limited authority to the director for minor repairs, changes and improvements to the existing commercial use, which use similar compatible or upgraded quality building materials. Um, and then also 2B, the additions are not visible from the facade that are under, this, under a specified maximum square footage threshold and that the city council also included director review um, of expansion of one tenant space into a second tenant space. So with, um, let's see, so from there we can begin our discussion. I'll go back two slides to show again that what we heard was definitely not business as usual and when there's an exterior modification that it should be reviewed by the, it should have a design permit and then when we asked about thresholds there was limited authority by the community development director. Thank you. Questions of staff? So when one uh, tenant space expands into another tenant space and they may not need a design permit, but they might change the parking requirements because the use is different from the existing use in the second space. So how would that uh, work? Um, I think typically your more intensified uses will be conditional use permits in which it would go before the Planning Commission. So for example, a restaurant that was going to expand or a, a, a bakery or something like that, it would come before, it, that would be a conditional use permit in whatever zone it's in. Yes. Yeah. Recently, I think you dealt with um, Zisso's Coffee that had the remodel next door for a wine bar and then the Jap Chinese restaurant expanded the other side. So, you know, those, you have to think about those kind of things. Do you want to deal with those or do you want to have staff deal with them? You know, if they're, I mean, that was a substantial remodel, but yet it wasn't really, you know, very much of anything. The um, really very, it wasn't really very substantial when you look at it. It was, it was a nice addition, but <clears throat> overall it didn't change the shopping center, you know, at all very much. The, the um, Mexican restaurant next to um, Bed Bath & Beyond expanded to the uh, space to the left, which used to be something else. And it's all seating now. Did, did the plan commission deal with that? I don't remember that. That would be, you know, internal with their parking and so forth. But that's the kind of thing that, you know, if it's just going to be something minor like that where they took over a space, you know, does that need to come to the planning commission? I don't think so. That's very, that's very minor. So you have those kind of things where things, you know, a lot of them are, you could, you know, staff could really, could really handle those those minor things. I've seen, you know, some of those lately that um, I thought, oh, the, the other one is over by um, uh, Baskin Robbins, the um, store that used to be the three minute workout store that then used to be, um, no, it wasn't a donut place. It was uh, maybe a bagel place. And then it was the uh, takeout dinner place. And then now it's a Japanese takeout crepe place. You know, to the, you, the, you don't want to deal with them every time, you know, if they do something different in there, do you? I, think we I don't know. Well, I think two of your I, examples I, we haven't dealt with mm -hmm. and a couple of your examples we yeah, have dealt yeah. with. So I'm not so sure how we're applying the rules right now. Anyway, yeah. you know, it's, it's a little unclear. 
because it seems like we didn't see the change from the catering company to a Japanese place, and we didn't see the Mexican restaurant application to expand into uh, the next rock shop or whatever it was. Yeah, rock shop. Well, I don't. I don't. We didn't see that. So I don't know how you're applying. Maybe they it didn't now. get. A, maybe they didn't come for permit. I just noticed it. <laughs> <laughs> a subdivision or a, a commercial area like that may have a use permit that applies to the whole project, right? That that's right. That's yeah. correct. And yeah. so if those apply, oh, that's it's why you're not seeing them. If it's, under, so that's, if it's under a certain square footage within um, plazas, and I think one of those um, examples was within the 3,000 square foot threshold, so then it's an allowed use under the master use permit. Um, Within, within this recommendation of 2C, I would say to limit it to the combination of two tenants, just limiting combination of two tenant spaces so that you don't run into the issue of Rite Aid moving in and taking over seven tenant spaces. So, you know, you don't want your, if you want to keep small businesses in certain areas. So. I, I think the key is, and what we would strive to do is to, to set up use standard such that if it's a similar use type that's simply doing a tenant improvement, uh, we're not going to bring them through a long discretionary process, but if they're changing the use, then they probably have to go through some kind of use permit process where we review it, look at parking and how the use characteristics, are they going to impact neighbors and those types of things. But if you're strictly in the inside, kind of sticking to the same type of use, um, to us there's not a lot of value added to bringing them through a discretionary process. Do we agree to that policy? Mm -hmm. comfortable with that. So are you looking at a hybrid between A, B, and C? I mean B, C, and D? Um, we're looking for direction. Um, should we include 2C in this, you know, um, to allow tenant spaces to expand into the next? Uh, I think along the long question, line should raise the edge, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 2B and C. A, B, and C is what we're talking about? Two A, B, and C is where we're seeing direction to move forward. So, so I would agree with that. My question mm -hmm. goes back to the 12A, and I'm trying to think of an example of a larger project that would not include some kind of exterior modification, and I'm not sure I can think of one. Where they didn't do the exterior, but they did the interior? Yeah, there was some large project that happened that had no exterior modifications Zizos. that we would want to see. Well, that wasn't We're that big. How about the dental Things office on 41st? What'd you do with that? That was before my the time. Orthodox. If you if you consider landscaping, you know, but I, I don't think we I, should. I think the issue with this one is the way the code is currently written. If you make any change to the exterior of a commercial building, you have to get a design permit, no matter no matter how minor. I think. Uh, about two years ago, we had somebody come in that wanted to replace their trash enclosure, and a strict application of the code would have been to require them to get a design permit. We let that one go, but to me, there's probably some level of change that I think we'd all agree is acceptable. Nailing down that amount might be tricky. Um, I think we could certainly start, though, with things like um, you know doing a trash enclosure. Maybe there's a certain square footage you are comfortable with if they want to make a change. I don't know what that magic number would be. Um, but I think that's where we're looking. We're not looking at making wholesale changes necessarily. But so there's some allowance for change. So when you come back, you would have definition of what is. Yeah, we'll work on that, and we'll we'll highlight it when we're here and say, here's what we came up with. Does the medical office there. make inside changes or just outside changes? No, we're inside. Lots, capital of, lots of inside. Yeah. And did that mostly come inside? Changes. Did that come to the planning commission? Yes, it did. Yeah. And, it and use, we'll it was a use change. We'll discuss medical as a main issue when we go through the issues and options at a later date. So yeah. what I'm hearing, if I just want to clarify, what I'm hearing on 12A is that um, require it for larger projects only and define exterior changes that would also require a design permit. That's what I'm hearing? Okay. I could go with that. Okay. Just a minor point is uh, in uh, 12A you refer to the uh, dollar amount the specified dollar amount. I think you should stay away from yeah. dollar amounts because this is this ordinance is going to last for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not big fans of valuation <laughs> for the <laughs> standards. So. so we have some consensus on, on 12A and 12B. Is there any motion or any recommendation there? 
I think we have consensus. Okay. So we're talking it. about um, uh, 2A, 2B, and 2C on that. That's correct. Yeah. And, and, two, and, and 2E also, if you want to add accessory structures, if you want to can't consider a, um, the garbage, and the recycling enclosure, or you know, an accessory structure, that does not need to, that doesn't need to come, come to the planning yeah. commission. So I would add, I would add that part of uh, 2E also to that. Or any, anything else that you see that's kind of minor that you want to, that it would be more appropriate for you to review that rather than the planning commission? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. On to residential design permits. Um, during the stakeholder interviews, groups voiced different opinions on the current threshold for residential design permits. One perspective agreed with the current level of review and explained that it results in high quality residential development. A different perspective thought it that the existing thresholds are too restrictive and that homeowners should be allowed to add on to their homes beyond the 400 square feet without additional oversight and cost to process a design permit through the Planning Commission. Um, what we're proposing here is kind of modest changes. The first option one is maintain existing thresholds as they are today. Option 2A is to um, expand beyond the 400 square foot addition, but only in the back of a home and not going up to a second story. Um, option 2B is a first story addition that's unlimited on the back of the house, so taking away the, um, not just beyond the 400 square feet, but allowing them to utilize as much area as they could fit with in the space behind the home, but not going vertical. Um, and then option 2C is includes a minor addition to the front of the home, and this would be um, enclosing a recessed entry. We would spell out exactly um, the details of what minor is under this situation. Um, um, so enclosing a recessed entrance, enclosing an open front porch, or installing a bay window are examples that we think would be appropriate. There. So again, 2A, 2B, and 2C, I guess 2A and 2B are mutually, um, can be separated, and then 2Cs can be included. So the, what we've heard was support for um, first story rear additions that go beyond 400 square feet, and um, on the top is the city council results, on the bottom, the planning commission, um, they didn't show as much support towards the first story additions beyond 400 square feet, but more of a preference towards the unlimited first story addition. Um, also, there was preference by uh, clear direction by both bodies to um, allow minor front additions that are well defined, such as enclosed recess entries and enclosing porches. So from there, Mayor Norton. Thank you. Questions, staff? I have a question. Please. So A says it can be greater than 400 square feet, and B says it can be unlimited. Mm -hmm. What's the intended So we difference? would switch the amount from, say, 400 to 600 okay. under A, and under B it would be unlimited, but in both situations only the first story. And in B unlimited, but it would still have to meet all of the setback requirements and... Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Where are we seeing this? Has this come to the Planning Commission very much? You know, these minor, really minor additions? I mean, mm -hmm. I know we're, we're okay. seeing big, we're seeing big remodels, but are we seeing these little things? We do. We, um, we typically put these on consent agenda when they come through because they aren't impactful to the neighbors typically because they meet setback requirements. You're not worried about privacy because there's no additional height. Um, so that's why we have added this as one of the options. Yeah, I, I just want to claim a little voting confusion here and that my votes would coincide with the, with the Planning Commission's direction okay. on this. So I think we, we are probably closer to a consensus than we... And the other thing to mention is that historic would, of course, go before the Planning Commission. Absolutely. As a CUP. I, I would, uh, just, just a note, I voted for uh, A, B, and C because in the options listed here on the first one, it doesn't specify first story. At least I didn't see it. So um, 
I ended up voting for all three. I see up here on 2 it says first story rear, so they would coincide. But from my, in my mind, when I was reading this, uh, A would allow second story addition smaller than 400 square feet in the rear. So just a note. I, that sounds like a very clear error on my part in putting this together. I so I apologize. Yeah. If anyone would like to see second story additions added to A, and that's what they'd like to base their vote on, I'd, we could consider that as well. But. I think the important thing about this is the comment that somebody wrote about the bottom, about uh, the way our current ordinance is. It is so vague and you have to make so many interpretations. It does take years for a staff member to figure out, you know, what it's saying. And each community development director that comes in has a different interpretation about what it's saying. So the important part about all of this is for us to come up with clear standards and clear guidelines that everyone knows what they're saying and there doesn't have to be any kind of interpretation. So, um, uh, you know, as Linda said, everyone else has said the devil's going to be in the detail, but I think this is a good step forward. Um, you know, I could go along with, um, uh, I did 2B and 2C, but I could include 2A in there. Uh, the important thing's going to be how it's actually written. And so we can understand what is a minor. <coughs> you know, uh, Capitola is the only jurisdiction in Central California that I know that requires every single family residence to go through a planning commission. And um, there's a design review process both in Los Gatos and in, in, in Pacific Grove that you have to go through before. The planning commissions are only required for, um, for variances or exceptions to the rules. Now, I'm not arguing against us going to planning commission with these issues. My, my argument is, is that the more you put, the more you put to the planning commission, um, not only does it increase the, the cost to the applicant, and not sure that they get a better product for this, but, but it also increases the time that your staff spends on processing these things. And so when they do that, there's more apt that they're going to overlook port important issues on bigger projects within this community. So if you want to direct your staff, to, to tackle the big issues in this community, which we have a lot of them, then you, you need to lighten their load to a point where they can go and do, and, and do a processing that can be done administratively and get it to, to staff. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not all looking at it. Um, I, I don't really have a problem with a addition to second story if it's under 400 square feet. I don't think that's a problem. But I, I, and I understand the, the, the desire in this community to see every single project and to protect neighborhoods. but. Um, uh, what you've suggested here is, is very reasonable, and no other jurisdiction requires what we require um, the people who apply within the city to do that. Susan? Um, I agree. I think what they're proposing here is quite reasonable. I do think Capitola is unique in the fact that uh, the city's basically built out. We live small little lots. We're all close together. And so even a small second story addition could have a significant impact on the adjacent neighbors. So I wouldn't like to see second stories included. And I like the idea that new single family residents have to go to the planning commission. And I know a lot of cities don't require that, but this community is so sensitive to design and making certain that, you know, the structure is going to fit in the existing neighborhood, I would like to see that stay in place. So uh, I'll speak to that issue, which is uh, I lobbied for strenuously for a long time as planning commissioner for single family homes that meet all the requirements to go on the consent agenda. So I think that's a good compromise because mm -hmm. then everyone gets a look at it. Mm -hmm. If they feel that there are issues or if neighbors show up, then it, you know, we discuss it. Otherwise, boom, it's done. Yeah, I think that's great. I totally agree. I was just going to ask about solar panels and on houses. Those aren't, those don't have to be reviewed by the planning commission. That's mm -hmm. just, that's a staff uh, over the counter. Building permit. I just want to um, reiterate the second story additions, even though sometimes they seem minor, those are the ones that seem, seem to bring out the neighbors the most. And I think it's important that, you know, whatever the ending decision is, that, that the citizens feel like they have an opportunity to be heard. 
Uh, and yeah. I agree with that. I, but w we should define in the code what they're allowed to do and not allowed to do. In other words, mm -hmm. the rules don't change because your neighbor says that you're too right. close to Absolutely. it. Right, absolutely. That's, not, that's right. not how the rules work. No, right, yeah. right. Okay. And the rules apply to everybody and they need to be consistent. That's mm -hmm. why we need a new ordinance that doesn't require interpretation. And we're going to be seeing this pretty soon on Topaz. That house is for sale again. That wonderful, magnificent house that's on three lots. It's fabulous. It's a fabulous old house, and it has a, a yard on either side. So there, there are three lots. I don't know if it's going to sell in three or sell in one. It's sold. I don't know whatever happened, but I did talk to the realtor, and I said, please talk to the adjacent property owner about improving your property, because I don't think we um, are able to... Um, affect that message very well but maybe you can for your prospective buyers and that will help that neighborhood and so forth because it does front against the mobile home the surf and sand mobile home park there so do we have consensus with, um, with item 12c with the clarity of not a, no second story on 2a okay, okay. thank you um, and the next question uh, 12d was geared towards increasing review authority as well, so I'm not going to get into that one because I just got clear consensus from this group of the correct thresholds and review authority. Um, next, we're going to, this is the last item that we've identified, so we've gone through five and we're at the sixth, so thank you. Um, 7A is floor area ratio, and specifically within this option, we're talking about decks. So, as staff, we went through the, f we, we've had many comments through projects when people ask why do we calculate decks towards our floor area it doesn't make and especially like covered decks on the first floor um, and decks above 30 inches off the back of a home so I think um, it's 17a isn't it yeah. oh I'm sorry <laughs> 17a everybody's yeah. fumbling around looking for it <laughs> <laughs> thank you you're allowed three mistakes uh, you <laughs> It was okay, Rich so didn't catch it either. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the first option, of course, is to maintain the existing regulation, uh, floor area calculation for decks, and that include we would include decks on the first story that are above 30 inches in height, um, also covered first story decks, and all second story decks. There is an exception <coughs> for up to 150 square feet. Um, option two increases the ex the exclusion from um, beyond 150 square feet, and that number would be um, decided upon in the dr when we draft it and then rediscussed. Option we've, we've broken down option three into four different options that um, decks not be included for front facades, so allow an exception for front facades. This would allow homes to have more of a um, interaction at the street level with people walking by and allow for people to actually have more prominent front decks. Also an exception for open space in those properties say along cliff or that back up to the river areas that you're not really looking out onto a neighboring property but you've got a beautiful natural beautiful um, nature that surrounds you that you'd really like to take in on possibly your second story deck um, allowing an exception there and then also for restaurants and hotels to take in the views of Capitola and our areas near the coast and eliminating the 3D option is to eliminate decks from the floor area ratio altogether um, what we heard was um, from uh, the City Council and Planning Commission was um, that we should look close, more closely at front, um, removing the floor area calculation from decks on the front facade, so having more interaction with the street. Also considering it along open space and for restaurants and hotels. So um, at that I'll have Mayor Norton begin the discussion. Thank you. Questions of staff? Discussion? Want me to start? Go I'll ahead. Start. Okay. Um, from the design standpoint, um, what we're really looking at in our community is massing. 
the mass of the structure is what's important. Square footage is just a formula that we use to control massing. Decks do not cause massing. You're not, you're not creating a volume. Um, it's not making the large appear house. But it creates a, another element that you can use in design and setback and, and articulation that um, people do not want to give that up today only in that when you do give it up and you have the deck, you reduce the size of your house. I think our floor area ratio is very fair, the way we have it, and that, um, that, that decks is any item that doesn't cause massing should not be included um, in the floor area ratio. Starting point. I would agree with that and second it by saying, especially on the front, one of the things that brings the community together is people that actually interact at the street level and being able to have a larger front deck encourages that sense of community and, and I'm all for it. I don't think it causes any massing and can be used to design, but it really helps the community. And we do it now with um, front porches, right? I mean, we allow, the f we, we allow people a certain size, is it 150 or 250 square foot front porch? Up to 150 100. square feet of covered covered front porch, porch that does yeah. not include is not included in FAR. So why wouldn't we be wanting decks to be included in that? The only the only uh, um, unusual case that I can remember that came to us was a deck in the backyard on Prospect. So maybe we could take a look at that. It covered the whole, the whole backyard, I guess, and the fellow had built a built-in for uh, oven or you know something like that and so there was concern about that that he had built too much had too much you know had <coughs> had put it out uh, they uh, built this oven out there and so forth so I think we, j we just need I can't remember what we did with it but we we need to take a look at that I think and see what we allow because it was it was obtrusive to the neighbor he thought it was too much and um, but it was his backyard so under Today's standard, though, you, you could have a deck as long as it's not greater than 30 inches from grade that goes, I think, within one foot of the property line. So that exists within today's standard. Josh? The, the only problem I have is the, a deck on the second floor could be very imposing to a neighbor. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with that issue other than the FAR? So we are not suggesting that all decks on the second story should be removed from the floor area calculation, only those on the front of the home, which um, from the front of the home you're facing out to the street and not into your neighbor's yard. So if there were to be a deck on the side of the home or the rear of the home on the second story, it would count towards your floor area ratio. Okay, I have no problem with the front. Okay. And then the exception being um, within 3B, if you back up to open space, then you would have um, meet the exception so along Riverview if you back up to the river and you don't have a neighbor behind you. So this is a, sort of a follow-up to what's been talked about is in my experience decks have been one of the thorniest issues uh, before the Planning Commission over time because they impact the neighbors much more than other parts of a house mm. because they're used by people outside and they're Etc. The views and the activities that go on in decks is a lot different than what happens in a living room. So there have been a lot of discussions over time. I'm not quite getting how floor area ratio is the right way to really address the deck issues that we face. Because, I mean, you could have a smaller house and have all these decks that are very offensive to the neighbors and that we might think that, well, that's really not the ideal design in this area. So I, I'm not quite... I, I, I guess we don't have to take everything that we're starting with here for as gospel, right? Right. So, so my question is, is this really the right way to be looking at mm. deck issues? I mean, my opinion is not. I think if we want to control deck issues, we put standards in the code that apply to decks, not try to control house size, because you made a great point. Just have a smaller house and you can have your decks. Yeah. So I think there's a better approach to it. and as we go through this, if we want to restrict where the location size of decks, we can certainly work on those standards. 
And we might tie that in like we did with the um, floor area ratio in certain neighborhoods, how wide the streets are, how large the lots are, and tie that same type of ratio in some way to the decks. So I just have one other clarification comment and thinking about prospect specifically, um, I think the example that you're talking about, the it was a fear before it got built, but there haven't been issues after it was built, but it does open up potentially on what you're calling an open space because it faces the, the, race, the railroad tracks. You and I would have an issue with, um, you know, unlimited second story decks on that side simply because they could be really obtrusive and offensive into the community below them. Right. Um, first story decks, though, I think when they face an open space would be fine, but I'd, I'd be really cautious by allowing second story decks on open space. Just And I think maybe an issue with that property was that when they built the, the oven outside that it was considered a permanent structure or something like that, which required a permit. Maybe that was it. Maybe that was the, the thing that, that the neighbors were mad about, that, that it was considered a permanent structure. I don't know, but we could look at that. Maybe it doesn't require a permit anymore to, to put an oven out there, but mm -hmm. it, you know, it's kind of like on Delpo and Depot Hill with that few people put that outdoor area and then a, whatever it was up. Uh, um. You know, it's fireplace or we're looking at a fire characteristic pit. that is traditional in our town. If you go stand in the village and you look back at, at the streetscape back there, what do you see? You see second story decks on, on seventy percent of the houses because the nature of design of a village with its with its Hollywood bowl shape is to actually to view to view down it. Yes, you're gonna have a person in front of you, yes you're gonna do that and you're gonna see over that. But our our city's design wi without without second story decks, you're changing the whole design nature of what we have out there. If you like the village and you like the way the city looks, you would want decks out there. Because it, it, it's a social pattern of a community to have outside decks. Pleasure Point, Pleasure Point just enacted new design guidelines for, for Pleasure Point area. Mm -hmm. And in that, they actually encourage people to do use their front yards. So they'll give you exceptions to the standards with lower and upper decks if you're facing on the street because it becomes safer and more social. So they're design standards, and they'll give you exceptions to how, what your setback is because of that. So th their whole intent was just to get people to look out on the street and be social and, be in, and look into mm -hmm. those points. I, I would agree. I, I, I think, um, you know, many, and I, I, I look at Depot Hill. You have some small lots that overlook the ocean that you wouldn't want to tie up your floor area ratio to... Um, given away to deck space, but that deck space certainly enhances what you have there with the small lots. So I don't think, we're not giving up design review here. We're just talking about, are we going to include this as part of uh, the floor area ratio? And, and I would like to give some flexibility to allow uh, those homes with small lots, which we happen to have a lot of them, to uh, make use of them in a, in a better way. Well, I agree with uh, Commissioner Newman. I don't think floor area ratios where you want to deal with the deck issue. And it's my understanding, I think, that we're going to ultimately come up, hopefully, with some design standards for residential neighborhoods that will fit those neighborhoods because regulations you have for Cliffwood Heights don't make any sense in Riverview Terrace yeah, we, we need to be a mid, little more fine-tuned in what our regulations are. So I don't think decks are a floor area ratio issue. I think decks are a neighborhood issue depending on what that neighborhood is. So that's where I think we ought to deal with those issues. Is there a consensus of the group of that? The only, the only comment I did, I thought we were on a good line when we were exempting. I mean, I agree that the deck should be regulated right. with how they affect, but I think we were on a good path by ex exempting the FAR from the front decks to encourage those. Right. They still have to go through the design, but they're going to be exempt from the ratio. So to encourage that, when you're, when you're using your allowable space, if it's not going to hurt you, you're going to throw it out there, and it enhances the design. It gives us design. I'm yeah. not trying to take away the regulation, though. 
Right. I, I think what you're saying makes good sense. It's just, do we have a floor area ratio discussion or are we having <coughs> a discussion? And I sort of think they need to be two separate things. But when we talk about floor area ratio, I would certainly be in favor of like a front porch not counting in the floor area ratio or figuring out a, a proportion that didn't count. But, I thought that but was but that's what this discussion is, isn't it? I think that's. I thought that's what this discussion is. Employer ratios, we're going to allow that flexibility. has nothing to do with design, but we don't want to tie people who maybe have an open space view to tie up employer ratio to a deck space. That's all this is. To me, that's how I took it. It's all we're talking about is I, th I think we're also up. moving in the idea that, that it can be designed by neighborhood, too. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, it right. doesn't meet design, but yes. So are you clear there, Katie, with what we're going to I'm not clear. I, I'm cl I wanted to clarify one point in um, option 3B, open space. It would be if you're adjacent to open space. So in the example of prospect, um, where they have a view of the ocean, but allowing them to have unlimited decks on the back side of that would not um, go with them what was proposed there. If you want us to expand that into all, you know, I think it was really if you are adjacent to open space. So just those properties that back up to um, a river or the ocean, then you'd have more. So the railroad uh, track in that area is not considered open space. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I think what I'm hearing park. is everybody yeah. agreeing that the decks in all of those cases should be excluded from the FAR calculation and standards for decks in all of those cases should be written and included in the neighborhood standards that you guys are going to go off and propose back. Mm -hmm. That's what I think I'm hearing I'm everybody you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are two different, two, yeah. two distinct differences. Okay. I'm clear. Okay, yeah. okay. Thank you. Okay. And, we, and I think we're going to have to be careful about the open space too because of what Linda said that there's some places where you know somebody can have a huge deck in it and it's not going to bother anybody and there's other areas because of our small lot size you can't let them have a huge giant deck because it would really be imposing on the, on the, all the neighbors and the whole neighborhood so we'll have to look at that yeah especially if we're in a visitor serving area where people are renting out their homes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. big well, parties I think that article in San Francisco Airbnb that they're cracking down on yeah. that that's yep. yeah. well what it, what, it, what we're doing here Katie needs to be written so it's not a discretionary issue with you. In other words, when someone comes in for an application, it's real clear to them whether their property, you know, how they would deal with the debt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next floor area ratio topic is basements. Um, currently, there's an exclusion for up to 250 square feet for basements. Option two is to increase the exclusion beyond the 250 square feet. Option three is to remove the basement from floor area ratio altogether. Um, what we heard was, um, again, let's not continue business as usual. Op well, actually, sorry, let me step back. This one we may have a really good discussion on. <laughs> it was one of our, our second to last item. Um, the city council um, stated a preference for removing basements from the floor area ratio calculation. The Planning Commission had a preference for option one of maintaining existing, so allowing up to a 250 square foot exception. So discussion, please. Give us some examples. I've never understood why, uh, what the rationale was for basements, unless it's park related to the parking requirements. Because uh, what different, I mean, nobody sees the basement, so I agree. how does it impact anyone? It, you know, our parking requirement looks at the total square footage of the home, and that's how we calculate parking. We can make sure that our parking requirement is not tied to the floor area in the future and separate the two from gross, gross area and... So I would be in favor of keeping the basement as part of whatever formula there is for parking, number of parking spaces, but mm -hmm. not counting it any other way. As far as the density in the lot, you're okay yeah. with it, enhancing the lot, but I agree, if you're moving more people in there because you've got, then the parking is the issue. That's a, that's a great, great point. Well, that's, that's the risk, but you also have people who, um, 
And there's a couple of good examples in Capitola that have large basements, but they're not moving more people in there. Yeah. They're setting up a theater room or they're, you know, moving in a, a, a pool table. And then I don't think that they should have an increased, you know, parking requirement, although the risk is that they'll, you know, throw in a bathroom and a kitchen and can't call do it, it for room. I mean yeah, they're gonna it's sell only the one person in my house so, you know. <laughs> when they sell it the next family moves you know yeah you can't go yeah. Right yeah. <laughs> hey <laughs> I, think, I think somebody who's got a big giant basement probably will have the parking so I don't think that's gonna be a problem for them so, so I'm hearing uh, is there do you want to discuss more from the Planning Commission perspective then on um, maintaining existing? Well, my, my concern was um, if we don't include that then uh, in the floor area ratio, um, you know, then uh, it's basically how does it fill out the property size itself. So um, it, it kind of, I think right now it kind of is um, unlimited, but I could, I could go either way. I, I, th I just thought that if we don't include that in the floor area ratio <coughs> that it um, you know it may allow allow for a different building uh, on the as far as the width the size of the lot square for the lot so I, I could go either way though I can't remember how the zoning ordinance defines a basement because it doesn't need to have <coughs> all f four sides down in the ground it only needs to have three, three sides I mean it gets pretty tricky doesn't it's it? It's tricky and it's yeah. like there's also access issues with basements that you're really difficult to deal with. You know Cliffwood Heights a lot of those houses were built the lower floor were built halfway into the ground now and you, you don't know that by when you go by it. Um, I'll tell you there's economics to not ever do a basement I mean we're not living in hurricane mm -hmm. Uh, or tornado country where you want to there wouldn't be I don't think you're going to see ev even with expanding the the uh, regulations I don't think you're going to be see people going where are marine terraces where there's water problems everywhere <coughs> you don't really want to put something underground do we have very many I don't think we do I don't I don't know how many do we have I don't there's not that many cliff with heights and they all have pumps yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, are there are a couple houses on Depot Hill that have full basements under them. Hmm. I think it's an incentive. I think uh, there's not going to be that much demand, but it, it shouldn't count against somebody. Right. I, I, yeah. I guess my thought was, I if if you are on a hillside, I can see where someone could add, you know, a third floor in there and have. I think the definition allows you to have one side and a portion of the other two sides underground but you can end up with the fourth side not underground mm -hmm. so I just ask that when you do this you rewrite the basement regulate definition about what is a basement, a basement uh, yeah. as part of it and then if it just is a basement in the ground I don't think you need to include it. I've got a couple thoughts and questions I'm, I'm wondering uh, are we talking about both both basements that are not accessible through the house as well as like I have a basement but you can't get to it from my house I have to go outside and go down underneath the house and go in it was a party room before we owned the house um, so my question is you know with housing shortage the way it is are we are we running the risk of impacting neighborhoods by people using uh, basements that are accessible through the house as um, rentable spaces even though there's not a bathroom in there uh, and then leaving it up to the neighborhood to uh, notify us and have us enforce it and also I'm wondering about um, our, you know we're, we're now in a different <coughs> situation with group homes and different um, state mandated uh, neighborhood uh, uses having to do with group homes and other types of uses like that and so my question is you know could someone uh, put more beds down even even without a bathroom can they put more so let's say not one of those people is going to be using uh, a car right but it, you know it could even be a, like a nursing home situation or whatever it's not a car impact but it's a neighborhood impact in that the use has been expanded are we opening ourselves up to that or am I the only person who's worried about that 
you know, in, in my mind, this is it's somewhat similar to the last discussion we had with the relationship between Fourier ratios and DEX. I, I think a lot of the concerns you raise are valid. I just don't know that Fourier ratio is the best way to deal with them. Um, in my mind, one of the benefits for those few properties that could build a, a successful basement is it may be encourage some folks to go down rather than up, cost notwithstanding. But if you do want to get some more square footage, that might be a more viable opportunity than providing mass on the street. I, I guess for me, the, the one house that came to mind when I thought about this was the one that um, hasn't been built, but they brought the plans next to the Shadow Brook. So in my mind, I'm thinking that was pretty much all basement except for the top floor, which was garage. So, um, you know, then how far does that go? And that, I was just stuck on one particular property. So There's another house on Prospect that are like that right now. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of them you guys dealt with recently where there was an outside design problem. There's actually a room underneath in the front. You know, it's facing, it's facing out. So they're not there, but they're one side's open. So I'm not so sure you would call that a basement. Mm -hmm. I think you have one wall open. It's, it's. Well, that's what the I, definition. I, I kind think, of I think under the city's existing definition, you can have one wall open. I mean, I could be wrong. It's been be a, a few years, problem. but. But this well, is back to, to, to floor ratio, and I think that just on pure floor ratio, I think that it's okay to be mm -hmm. exempt. The other issues, like we said with the deck, those concerns, we can address those in the design process. But with regard to FAR, I, I think it could, should be exempt. Yeah, it just depends on how you define a basement. What is a basement? It, it seems if you were going to exempt basements, you probably would pretty closely define the basement. What the basement yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having a basement with, you know, a wall of glass looking out over the river probably isn't the basement. Right. Any, any basement <laughs> that you'd want to exclude from FAR at least. Yeah. By yeah. building code, yeah. any yeah. basement yeah. requires a secondary yeah. access. Yeah. In other words, you have to be able to get that basement without going in the door you came out. Oh. Yeah. So that makes it real difficult in the design process. You have a window well or some way you climb out. but you Unless we have old ones, old basements in our homes. Yeah. You know, they don't have that. They're, they're there, so. Okay, do you, are we clear with that, Katie, or would you? <laughs> um, so, so there's like what I'm hearing is consensus to uh, remove basements from the floor area ratio as long as parking is calculated, as long as that square footage is included towards parking. Correct. And as Correct. long as you have basement. a clear definition. And basement is defined clearly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the last one, um, 17C. Floor area ratio related to phantom floors, roof eaves, and bay windows. So again, these are more design characteristics that you find on a home. Um, roof eaves that extend further than I think it's 18 inches count towards the floor area ratio. A bay window um, counts towards floor area ratio. Beyond, um, and then also a phantom floor. And a phantom floor is when you walk into a house if if it's a grand entryway that goes beyond 16 feet, maybe it has a 18 <coughs> foot high ceiling, we would actually <coughs> count that area beyond the 18 feet. We count that area twice if it's taller than 16 feet. So this went out in our survey and what we heard was very clear direction to remove all three. 80% um, by city council and 80% by <coughs> planning commission. Um, discussion, please. Is this our highest con uh, consensus? This is the highest. Yeah. Yeah. We're leaving on a I high think note. I we had consensus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have so consensus, Katie. Yeah, on, on the Planning Commission side, the 20% numbers you see up there, I voted for all of them. Okay. <laughs> the confusion rule. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to confess. Yeah. Way to go. 100%. You know, I, don't, I don't think anyone in this city knew that the 18-inch eaves were in the ordinance mm. I did. until the last couple <laughs> of years ago. And nobody even knew it. Everybody built with three-foot eaves. Mm -hmm. I found that. that it's, it's for large birds to live under. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you all for the great discussion this evening. If there's any other issues you'd like to talk about at this time, this is very productive, and I really appreciate all your effort. Yeah. At thank this you. rate, we'll be done in three weeks? Yes, we're rescheduling. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I actually have a question. So, you know, we all, we all realize that this zoning ordinance that we're working on is not going to be effective until it's approved by the Coastal Commission. Um, 
are we trying to work with them as we go through the process because my expectation is we're going to do this they're going to see it they're going to tear it apart and we're going to do it all over again um, just because of how past history has been so I just wondered if there's an effort to try and coordinate with them as we go through the process. Yeah, there has. We've had a couple of meetings with Coastal Commission staff to kind of keep them apprised of, you know, the things we're working on. Um, we've discussed some of the issues that we thought would be of specific interest to them. Um, the challenge in defense of Coastal Commission staff at this point has been they don't have anything concrete to really respond to. Like we've shared our issues and options paper and they look in and say, no, oh, it's great. Let us know what you do and then we'll react to it rather than, you know, giving us a reaction to five hypothetical scenarios. Um, we do share your concern. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that I don't think out of this code we're going to make really big changes. I think we're going to define things, try to make things a little bit more streamlined and simplified. Um, I don't think those types of changes are going to upset the Coastal Commission, um, but there are bigger policy issues that they're probably going to want to bring into the discussion. Um, and I, I fully expect that we're going to have to grapple with that when we get there. Uh, but we are continuing to work with them. Uh, getting them to commit to working on something at a hypothetical stage is challenging. Thank you. We, we, we have design consultants actually on contract to help us through this process. Is that correct? That's right. Can you give them, um, for instance, the sign ordinance as a starting point? Mm -hmm. I mean, I could just see that thing. That thing itself could be almost a document itself. And yeah, after uh, tonight's meeting, we'll report back to Ben Noble, who's taking the lead on writing the zoning code. He's, he's starting to draft parts of the zoning code right now that we feel are pretty straightforward and we can move forward with. And we'll keep feeding him direction as we get it from you to work on those chapters. Uh, we'll obviously review it then before we bring it before you all for a review. Is there any member of the public who would like to address us on any of the issues we discussed tonight? Please step forward. Good evening. I'm Adam Samuels, 504 El Salto. Hello. Um, thank you, first of all. I think I had no idea coming into this what it was going to look like, so I think it was really an effective process. So I commend you all for the work you did to prepare. That's yeah. really awesome. Um, the thing I can see is there'll be some more lively discussion coming up. <laughs> and uh, I, I just I think the thing that would be helpful, I didn't see until tonight that there was actually like a proposed schedule for what would be happening when as quickly as we can keep that revised and up to date to just help us all. I think that'll just make it more, um, you know, if there are people who want to come and speak about particular things, having that insight will just help help us all kind of participate with you in that process. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Are we doing advertising in the newspaper for this? Um, we have not advertised in the newspaper. No, I mean, as the, as the meetings go on, do we, are we going to advertise what the meetings will be about? As of right now, the plan is to place it um, on the website within the scroll and in uh, the public locations throughout the city, but we were not planning on putting it in the newspaper. So if you'd like to discuss. Yeah. Nice. I, I think I, I make sure there's something else. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. May I speak about the zoning update survey? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, in reading the results of the zoning update survey, I see that many respondents did not agree with some of the assumptions made in the survey, most notably that growth is inevitable. Of course, growth means different things to different people, but one thing stood out from the survey to many people in Capitola, growth doesn't mean cramming in more people, cars, buildings, pavement, etc. Many people express the desire to see growth in Capitola slowed down a bit. Capitola is already quite built up. When we think about living in Capitola, we know that most people want their neighborhoods to be peaceful, quiet, green, and easy to navigate. 
People want their homes and the areas surrounding them to be sanctuaries from the stresses of the larger world. I believe the general plan in part acknowledges this. As I continued to read the survey, it was clear to me that many people want more green space in Capitola. With this, I heartily agree. There is no doubt that green space improves the quality of life for everyone, from children to seniors. As our population increases, we should be adding more green space. I know you've heard me speak previously about the park projects that I feel add to the quality of life in Capitola, such as Gregor and Rispin. With those parks in place, I hope we can together move forward to a future in Capitola that demonstrates that growth requires a careful stewardship of our green space. Thank you. Thank you. When we get past the public, I kind of got didn't get a chance. To I think we can go there now. If you address like. the uh, question of more issues that maybe we can discuss tonight. I wanted to, since there might not be a joint meeting again, I wanted to discuss issue 18 briefly. That's the one about the appeal by the city council of a planning commission decision. So, um, Capitola has had a history of uh, independent city council, and this survey. Uh, really reinforces that because uh, basically apparently some uh, a superior court judge in uh, Fresno or Los Angeles or someplace said the city council can't appeal planning commission decisions and the majority of the <laughs> city council said leave our ordinance just the way it is so I like that uh, of, uh, sort of thumbing thumbing your nose at the uh, decision uh, so I don't I really don't know why we have this one on here anyway as far as our I mean has the city attorney uh, made a recommendation that uh, we need to follow here or we have conferred with the city attorney I think it's a question of how we want to handle it my understanding is the past practice and the way it's outlined in the code is a city council person could appeal any planning commission decision as a council member um, without paying a fee and they can also sit and make a vote on that item um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the court case that you referred to said <coughs> you can't also vote on an item that well, you're appealing. Well, the, the, ju the judge went off on the idea that if you appeal it, you're not unbiased. But apparently, he doesn't know that when you run for office, <laughs> you go, you spend weeks and months explaining to all the electorate what your views are on some of these issues. So you're not the city council people aren't unbiased to start with. I mean, they, the Rispin, for example. I mean, that's uh, the, the newspaper asks you questions about it. It's uh, on and on. But that brings up the topic of more of meeting together, and I really think it's important that we meet together. These topics are things we're going to be working on, and we shouldn't be working separately. I don't know how we can do that, how we can come together every month or six weeks or something like that and and check in and see if we're all going, we need to go in the same direction on this. We don't want to have you create a document, the Planning Commission create a document and then it comes to the City Council and then we, we change it substantially. That's And it's just going to be confusing to the public and confusing to all of us. It would be really helpful if somehow, without having everybody to have a million meetings, but somehow work together on this and meet together so that we're on the same page. It's so important to do that. Um, I was just going to explain further the call-up process that could be utilized. A call-up process, um, when the Planning Commission makes a decision on an item, the City Council, if we had a call-up process, they could call up an issue um, and you could either call it up based on a majority of you can codify it so that it requires a majority of city council members to call it up or that a sole um, city council member could call up an item and what it does instead of highlighting issues that a city council member might have with the process it, it gives the city council the um, authority to make the final review on the process so um, in a previous jurisdiction I worked for, a good example is a large hotel that went through that the Planning Commission call, um, voted on. And the City Council, because it was, they didn't necessarily have 
disagreement between what the Planning Commission approved, but they just wanted, they knew there were so many concerns within our community that they wanted to have the last view, like to look, at, look over the whole application and add any additional conditions that were necessary or design modifications. So in that situation, it, it works. And in, in that instance, when um, you have a, otherwise, um, what Rich was referring to with the existing appeal process, if a city council member were to appeal, they'd have to remove themselves from the decision body and wouldn't really be able to participate other than, you know, being the appellant on the case. So it's so when, when does this apply to the public? Well, the public can actually appeal any, uh, any decision by themselves. So it's a public right for anyone to appeal a, a, a planning commission decision to the city council, right? Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes. Is that inside coastal zone or at any time at our city? Anywhere. Okay. Yeah. Why is the council member any different? Well, the difference is the council member can't continue to act as a council member and decide on the issue and to hear the appeal. The yeah, they have bias. a vote. That's the difference. They have a vote. And it's it's <coughs> so what you're suggesting then is, is that, that it, it'd be able to be appealed to the council, but it would take a, a vote of the council of three to actually to actually put it on the agenda? So, so um, the appeal process would remain in the code um, as any member of the public can appeal. Then there would be a separate process for a call-up in which you could decide if you want it to be a majority call-up or a, a single city council member could call up an item after the planning commission has decided and um, do the final review of a project. The we will be working more closely with our attorney on it because by having a call-up process, typically you would have a board of adjustment in which your the city council's decision could then be appealed to. You'd have another board rather than going straight to court. So that is something that I need to check in with Tony about. Well, th in, th in, th in this case, Ed's, Ed's comment that why are we reviewing this now? And we really don't have clear decision on it. But my advice is that there's a lot of legal ramifications of how to do the call up and doing it correctly between complying with the Brown Act and acting in a quasi judicial role um, in a hearing without having prior prejudice, basically. So I, my suggestion is I don't I don't know the staff. I think there's more research to do on this one and trying to come up with something that gets at what the city council would like to do, but at the same time complies with the law. So. Historically, hasn't it been that people would go to council members and ask council members to appeal something because you could do it without paying the fee? Right. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of council appeals have come that way. There is a citizen who would appeal it. They just didn't want to pay the fee, so they got a council member to do it for them. So the citizen <coughs> would still always have the opportunity to do it. And mm -hmm. Pay the it's a pretty minor fee. So isn't this isn't then am I understanding it correctly? Is a call up just an end run around uh, a council member not being able to vote? It's creating a an opportunity for council to review a project that they typically wouldn't be able to review. So, so yeah. That's an end round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why it's just tricky. No. <laughs> 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 yeah, like it is. <laughs> this is really a what if then, because I, I, I don't, I've never appealed one project. I, I don't know if any other council member have. It basically comes from the applicant appealing it from the planning commission to, to, to a decision in front of us. So is this something? So maybe we need to change I, that rule, you know, so that it doesn't uh -huh. end up being. But that's something different. What I, what I wanted to get back to is. Are we going to have some more joint meetings? Because I would like to. Not that I want to have a lot of extra meetings, but I don't want the Planning Commission and the City Council to be at odds on policies, if we can at all work together to formulate these things. I didn't get that feeling tonight. I felt no, 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 but we don't have any other meetings together. We need to have more well, of these. It's very I, productive, I, don't you think? Yeah, but a lot of the stuff that's coming up is going to be very technical. It's going to be more Planning Commission oriented, and I'm thinking a chance for them to go through that. I, I, I trust. What was that? I want to trust that it's going to come back, and we do have the, the when, we, when we see it, we're going to have the same success. I, you know, I don't I don't want to build in a fear that we're not going to come up with an end product, and I don't want to waste the planning commission's time. But I, yeah. Let's let's play it by ear then. Let's go through keep through the process as we have planned. If we feel that there's a need to bring the 
Planning Commission and City Council back at a point we can do that. Can I can I just make a couple comments? Because looking at the survey, I think we got a lot of good information from the survey. And if you look at the items that we didn't talk about tonight, there are a lot of items where the Planning Commission had a majority consensus and the Council did not. And what I've heard from Council is that they respect the Planning Commission's job and our experience and our, our knowledge and are going to respect the discussions that we have. And if you look through the survey and you find those where you just really disagree with what the Planning Commission is, is going for, I think it, it, it behooves us to be close with our Council members or other Council members as well. I mean, as a Planning Commissioner, I don't have a problem talking with any Council member. <coughs> But if there's something that you really disagree with or you would really like to push it in a different direction, you've got the survey to give you an indication of what direction we're going to go. And what I saw tonight was the survey has validity because it led us down a path where we all pretty much agreed, which is what it said. There are only, I think, two items where neither one of us came up to a consensus. And better yet, Linda, on that is, is, is if you get with the planning commissioners and you are having your discussion and it seems like among yourselves you're not able to reach consensus, mm -hmm. I would just put that aside and those are the ones that, that we can stack those up and, and then when we get like eight or ten items, we'll schedule another joint meeting and say, okay, these are the ones we're struggling with or these are the ones we anticipate we're going to struggle with because mm -hmm. I think we kind of know what those might be. And then it would be, then we, boom, we schedule another meeting and we do this again and we, we work through it. Is it in the Fair Processing Act that it's required that, that um, uh, there be a process where city planning commission decisions can be appealed or must be, can be appealed to the, to the city council? So there are requirements in state planning and land use law that do require certain permit types be appealable. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know which ones have those, but I'm certain, pretty certain the conditional use permits well, vary. Maybe it'd be good for us to know maps. which what is what is under that directive, what's required by law and what isn't. Maybe we can separate items that can be appealed and what can't be appealed. Yeah, maps, UPs, variances, I think have to mm -hmm. so, well, we can look into that. Uh, yeah, I think also if we could figure out a way where the appeal process didn't uh, appear to pit a planning, a planning commission or the planning commission against a single uh, council member, if we could figure out a way to adapt or you know change our procedure for that, it might, you know, and it might be that, you know, you can't ask a council member to do it. You have to do it yourself. If you want to appeal it, you have to do it yourself. I don't know. I don't know if there's any agreement about that or whether we want to discuss it, but let's find out what the what the law says and what, what's our ground rules. Is we'll dig into that one a little deeper. And then issue 18 isn't heard till the end of July, right? <laughs> so we've mm -hmm. got some time to... Well, maybe sooner now. <laughs> oh, it's gone. <laughs> Josh? Yeah, um, I like the idea of a joint meeting and um, Ed was sort of, Ed, yeah, right. you were sort of going in the direction I'm going, but maybe in the course of the discussion with city planning uh, excuse me, the Planning Commission, you'll see certain items that maybe a joint meeting would really be really good because that would shorten the process, okay? So that discussion will happen as scheduled and then some of those maybe you can pull forward so we don't have to go through city plan um, city council so we could have a joint one. Um, the, the city council actually has a little extra business here. Do you want the planning commission to stay in Jamie? No. Yes or not? Well, I think we can take care of this pretty quickly here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to announce to the city council, I got a report from the public works director uh, this morning that at McGregor we're about 50% of the way through the skate park contract, which is $100,000 for the skate park at McGregor. Um, and that's $50,000 of Monty's money and $50,000 of city's money. So we're about halfway through that contract today. By your next meeting, we will be 90% of the way through that contract. And I know that um, a council member asked to bring that uh, contract and plan forward at the next meeting. Uh, I just wanted to notify you that if you do want to hear that, my suggestion would be to schedule a special meeting between now and then. Otherwise, I think the cat's out of the bag uh, by next meeting. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, make a request to withdraw my request to have that put on the agenda for the next meeting. Okay. That's all right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all.
Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you to Thank Scott. Thank you, Katie, for great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. They have a plan. Only two mistakes. Yay. <laughs> oh, why'd you cut that out? <laughs> you know, and I, I'm just... I typos. Typos. Yeah. That's right. We've got to keep that new one on the show. <laughs>